there. It's Gary Parrish. Welcome back to the CBS Sports Eye on College Basketball podcast, where we sometimes discuss camel fighting, dodo birds, and leaky black. Matt Norlander is here with me, and we are obviously in Arizona in advance of tonight's national title game. Final game of the season, 2024 NCAA tournament, UConn against Purdue. Can't wait. And not many things could knock the national title game out of the A block of a podcast or a television show on the day of the national title game. But one thing that could is a divorce between Kentucky and John Calipari, and that's what it appears we are getting. John Calipari reportedly heading to Arkansas. Matt yeah. Norlander, give us the details. <laughs> what a, it has been an insane, I don't know, 15 hours at this point. But, yes, uh, word started to really percolate on Sunday afternoon and then into Sunday evening here in Arizona. Uh, this is not official as we do the show live on CBS Sports Network. Uh, shouts to everyone watching live, and obviously if you're getting to the pod afterward, we appreciate you so much. But Calipari headed to Fayetteville. Uh, reports are that he's going to meet with the team, uh, his Kentucky players, later this Monday afternoon. And then a deal is, is thought to be finalized here before we get out of Monday, Tuesday at the absolute latest. It is the national title. Title day, so maybe they wait one day to make it official. But here we go. I'm told five years, somewhere in the neighborhood of about eight million per year. Um, so much money is being tossed around with this job because Calipari is also going to get a huge injection of NIL money. I don't know if Arkansas is going to have more NIL money than any program in the sport, but I believe that's very much on the table. Uh, there are so many ways we can go with this, but that, that is the big news. It has taken over the sport over the past 12, 14 hours, understandably so, and overshadowed a little bit of the title game. Um, I can't ever remember a story like that. Occasionally, GP, you get a coach movement in Final Four weekend, but I can't ever remember one this size. McRoy Williams opting to retire on April Fool's Day, the year of the bubble tournament, was a very, very big story. But even that pales in comparison to this because he's remaining in the sport and he's hopping from one SEC job to another and not just one SEC job to another. He's leaving a top three gig in college basketball to get a fresh start and a new lease on life in Fayetteville. He's the rare coach who has won a national championship at a school and then leaves that school for another college job. This does not normally happen in this sport, but it is happening with John Calipari. So the obvious question is why? Why does John Calipari want to move to Arkansas? Why does Arkansas want John Calipari? Why does Kentucky celebrate this departure? I think this is one of those developments where I don't know that it'll work out well for everybody because, as always, we'll see. But I think in theory, this is a situation where everybody gets what they want. Arkansas, after missing on a couple of candidates, needed to, you know, close this coaching search. And to do it with a big bang like John Calipari, I don't think you can overstate how excited that fan base will be about it. Because even though there has been disappointing stuff at Kentucky, you know, John Calipari did just coach a team to a number three seed in the NCAA tournament, and he's obviously got a recruiting class that a lot of people believe he can now take from Lexington to Fayetteville. It makes sense for Arkansas. I think it also makes sense for John Calipari because this is a man who has done amazing things throughout his career and did incredible things early at Kentucky, but since he went to the Final Four in 2015 with what was an undefeated team at the time, he's never been back. Nine straight years, no trips to the Final Four. That is the longest he's ever coached in college without going to a Final Four. His life has been, I don't want to speak for him, but I would assume on some level miserable. I've heard that from multiple sources, yes. So he gets to just get a quality of life change, fresh set of expectations, fresh set of fan of fans, all of whom will be better equipped to listen to the things he says and get excited about him as opposed to the Kentucky fans who had clearly just had enough of it and they were done. And then we get to Kentucky. This is like a blessing for Kentucky yeah. because they wanted a coaching change. I genuinely believe that if Mitch Barnhart could have snapped his fingers one day after the loss to Oakland in this NCAA tournament and just made John Calipari go away for zero dollars, he would have done that. He would have kept snapping. He would have snapped nonstop. But it would have cost in excess of $30 million for Kentucky to make a coaching change. Now it appears John Calipari voluntarily leaves Kentucky for Arkansas. It won't cost the Wildcats a penny. Yeah, and as we said on the pod, um, I guess the day after that Calipari and Mitch Barnhart went on local television and tried to do a make good, and it was fine, if not a little bit awkward, 
I said the only reason why this is a thing is because of money. And, you know, the Kraft family, who is a major donor around Kentucky, wasn't going to pay John Cal- help pay for John Calipari to go away for more than $30 million. He wasn't going to leave under uh, under those circumstances and just resign without getting his money here. Kentucky's off the hook entirely. Um, just to kind of go into a little bit further of what you were saying there. Yes. I mean, I have heard um, from people connected to John Calipari that it has not been uh, a fun situation for him, for his wife, for his family with in, in Lexington. It's been bad, and there's been dysfunction within the athletic department at Kentucky. He has kind of operated on an island. It had reached a very uh, a very bad point, but with the money being what it was to get rid of him, it was just it was, uh, it was an awkward arrangement, and they were going to try and do it for another year or two. I mentioned this on the late, late overnight pod with Kyle Boone, um, but I'll, re- I'll, I'll share it here uh, again. What's crazy about this is that because if you really want to peel back the reason why we're here, it's because a bunch of really, really, really rich people connected to SMU were not satisfied with the idea that their program would get left behind in conference realignment. So they took a deal in pushing hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars into SMU just to get into the ACC. And because of that, SMU then was unsatisfied with Rob Lanier running the program in a transition year because it's going to join the ACC. Yes, reminder, SMU is going to the ACC. He got fired after two seasons and making the NIT, a move that was criticized. That prompted Andy Enfield, after about a week of dawdling, to finally get up and make the move to SMU. That opens USC, which then triggers Eric Musselman to be the top target out of Arkansas after a few days of flirtation. Musselman then makes the move. It opens up Arkansas. There was some Beard. I was told boosters were influential in trying to get Chris Beard to Arkansas. That fell through. Jerome Tang got really, really close at the altar. Ultimately, he decided to double back and go to Kansas State. And from there, it it all bubbled up because, as I was told, I was GP. I was told this by a source more than a month ago when, and I re- I revealed this. Uh, late Sunday night, John Calipari had he was intrigued by the Ohio State opening. Now it never got too far down the road because of a number of factors. But if you could have, you know, snapped your fingers and told John Calipari you can be the coach at Ohio State a month ago, he would have done it. But it never materialized. But as that was kind of going on behind the scenes, and we were waiting to see who was getting the Ohio State job, someone said, "Hey, listen, just." If ever a job came open, the sneaky one that he actually likes is Arkansas. And it's wild to think a month later, the circumstances that that unraveled, that enabled this to happen, him being close with the Tyson family and them getting it done, I'm told they are prepared to, you know, to put millions and millions to keep the Arkansas program relevant, top 10 good. We'll see if it happens. That's just a little bit of a behind the scenes. I want to throw it right back to you, though. Do you think... Arkansas is poised with John Calipari to have a stretch here. Let's call it four or five years. It's expected to be a five-year deal. GP, do you think that Arkansas, you can see what they did recently under Muss, and they had a letdown year, and that's why we're here to begin with. Do you think that he can get them to sustain relevance? We know he's going to get players, but three, four years from now, when you and I are talking on this show, are we talking about an Arkansas program that has made deep runs in the tournament, an Arkansas program that is, has multiple top three finishes in the SEC? Because I think it's a valid question and very intriguing. There's a lot of hype around this. There's a lot of buzz. I get all that. You're getting them for a lot of reasons. I'm wondering if he can have a strong finish to his career amid, obviously, a shifting landscape within the SEC, Texas and Oklahoma also joining. That's going to be a 16 league starting next season. Well, it is interesting that you know the past season of Eric Musselman at Arkansas was obviously not great. Every other season was pretty good. I don't know that John Calipari will be able to match the early success that Eric Musselman had, although I wouldn't rule it out because he's going to have players. But here's the problem with that. He's always had players. That's never been the issue. So I know if you're an Arkansas fan right now, you're looking at this and going, we are giving a Hall of Fame coach, a man who has um, been at the tip top of this sport for a long time, all of the resources he could possibly need to build and run the best basketball program in the country. And you know what Kentucky fans will tell you? He's had that. Mm -hmm. We'd give him that too. And we just lost to Oakland, and two years ago we lost to St. Peter's. So good luck. That's the conversation in Lexington right now. I do think, because when you talk to people who have been close to John Calipari in recent years, around John Calipari in recent years, folks who were based in the Lexington area. My history is is uh, well documented. I was John Calipari's beat writer for uh, four full seasons at the Commercial Appeal in Memphis. I spent a lot of time with him then. But over the 
recent years, what folks who spend a lot of time with him now will tell you is that he got a little comfortable, got a little complacent, maybe lost his edge a little bit. And I will say if, if any of that is true, and I'm not here to say definitively that it is, but if any of that is true, it is this type of thing that can re-energize you yeah. and reinvigorate you and make you so determined to not fail in this mass of opportunity, to not fail after leaving Kentucky, to actually beat Kentucky in the same conference going forward that I could see if any of the complacency or comfortability was were real issues with him, that stuff can get knocked away really quickly and he can go full speed ahead. So you tell me anybody in America, any coach in America, with few exceptions, mm -hmm. are going to have all of these resources. I'm going to assume they're going to be relevant, but will he take Arkansas to where he once took Kentucky? We'll see. He hasn't really been close to that as a basketball coach in a long time. Yeah, he hasn't. And just so our, our viewers are clear and people listen to the show, well, obviously, as after we get past the title game, this is a job worth a ton of analysis. There's a lot to be looked into in terms of the Arkansas fan base, its expectation level. And this is not a group of fans that are going to be okay with John Calipari coming in, bringing in top five recruiting classes, and you look up in the first three seasons, they don't have better than a fifth place finish in the SEC and don't make a Sweet 16. That will not cut it. That will be intriguing to see how that develops and, and the staff Calipari brings with him from Kentucky, who else? he adds and the players they get and if that freshman class comes along with them real quick on the on the Kentucky end before we get to candidates here um, fan base is obviously thrilled we said it before we said it multiple times on the show they were done they were fed up they were they were not thrilled with the idea that we'd have to endure this it was it was a wonderful time you may won a national championship hadn't been to a final four in nine years the expectations are high it's as pressurized of a job as any but I think this is really really healthy for both sides I, I, I want to emphasize this for Calipari to get a new start a new lease on life a change of scenery I think it's very, very good for him. It's also very good for Kentucky to have someone else new come in. What, who that name is remains to be seen. The program, it, it can and will get back to a place of glory, okay? And it's really not that far removed from it, period. It's, we're talking about March disappointments overall. We wait and see on, if, on the guy that gets it and how he runs it. And we'll talk candidates in just a second again. But to me, what's important is you need someone who understands the fan base, understand what the job is, the history, but also what it can be, and has some sort of split between having some of the stuff that Cal had in terms of handling the job because it's very hard, but you also absolutely have to be your own person and know how to run Kentucky in this era. And to me, it's a little bit of a tough needle to thread, and I think they can nail the hire just as easily as they can miss on it because, as you well know, just because you're Kentucky – it does not guarantee you're going to have success, even if you hire a big-name coach. It doesn't matter. We've seen coaches at North Carolina not do so well, at Kentucky not do so well, at Indiana not do so well. Regardless of where your program is in the pecking order of college basketball, the wrong hire can send it the wrong way very, very quickly. Don't believe me? If you're a Kentucky fan, look across the state of Louisville. Yes, or look at the guy who was there before Calipari. Billy, Billy Clyde Gillespie. Yes. And, of course, to your point, I do think this is maybe not the one job, but certainly the, the biggest job in the sport where personality does matter. Mm. It, it, it is something that if you're Mitch Barnhart, that administration, you have to know who you're hiring, not just look at uh, career records and career accomplishments in Wikipedia pages. You need to know who you're hiring as a person and know that they can handle what is an impossible situation when things get a little bumpy. And anytime things aren't operating way up here, they are, by definition, bumpy. So let's talk candidates now. Obviously, you see Kentucky fans' wish list, and it starts at the tip top with a guy, it seems, that is coaching later tonight in a national championship game. That is Dan Hurley. I'll keep this simple. Obviously, if you could hire Dan Hurley, you should do that. He's amazing. He's a future Naismith Memorial Hall of Famer, and he is, barring a surprise tonight, about to be a two-time national champion. Respectfully to the Kentucky program, I'd be surprised if Dan Hurley wanted to leave UConn I, uh, for Kentucky. Yes. So then you move on. You won't Call Jay Wright if you want to. I certainly would. But, again, Jay Wright has shown no indication that he Zero. wants to get back into college basketball coaching. So I, I do believe there's some big names at the top that you, you – yeah, do your due diligence. It, send a text. Yes. But once they say politely that they're going to pass, then you get to – uh, maybe a Billy Donovan, who, of course, is with the Chicago Bulls right now, but that's not going so well. 
I would make that phone call. I said no to Kentucky twice before, by the way. But under different circumstances. Yes. These are very different circumstances Billy's living in right now. And I do think this is important to realize. Among the reasons that Billy Donovan was eager to get out of college basketball when he did is he was fed up with the recruiting aspect of it. <laughs> yeah, look okay. at it now. Okay, but now it's more transactional than ever. True. And, and like, all out in the light for the most part. Like, you, you don't have to work in the dark and work in the shadows and, you know, yeah. take AAU coaches. Well, you got to work calls, more. But, no, you have to have money. Yes. You have to have money. Yes. It, but when I talk to college basketball coaches now, they say that when they used to go into living rooms, it was about style of play, about history, about uh, your roster, about your facilities. And now when you walk in, they really just want to know if you got 100000 or 300000 for them in NIL. So I actually think that if you've got the resources, makes it easier to recruit. You don't have to show up to every grassroots game to show your present. You just have to have the most money at the end, and that stuff will work a lot like NBA free agency does. So if I'm Billy Donovan, I'm a little more interested in college basketball under this format, but I'm not Billy Donovan, so I'll let him speak for himself some other time. But just for the sake of the conversation, let me ask you this. We, I just listed four dudes. You think yep. any of them could be the next head coach at Kentucky? Could be, obviously possible. I'm going to say no. Uh, I would lean no among the Jay Wright no shot. Dan Hurley, I think it would be a terrible decision for him. Uh, he's, he is where he should be, and he's about to coach UConn in a second straight national championship game, arguably the best UConn team ever. Uh, Billy Donovan, and then was there a fourth in there? I think I listed Dan Hurley, Jay Wright, Billy Donovan, and if okay. we assume those three yeah. all pass on the yeah. opportunity, the phone call I would make, and I know the buyout is big, it's reportedly $18 million. Yes. I would make Nate Oates at Alabama tell me no. He's already been operating arguably the best basketball program in that conference for the past five years or so. Mm -hmm. He might say no. And But if I'm Kentucky, and I know that number's big, $18 million, but look at what Arkansas just invested in basketball. Yeah. Are you going to let Arkansas out invest you in basketball? And you just saved, and I know it's not quite this way, but in theory to get rid of John Calipari, if you want to do it, it's going to cost you more than $30 million. Now it costs you nothing. If I'm, our, if I'm at, uh, Kentucky, I am absolutely, if those first three guys are just not interested, Nate Oates is going to have to tell me no. Uh, Scott Drew might even be ahead of Nate Oates because he has a national championship. That's a, certainly a name to, to monitor there. Those are some of the bigger names. We, if you're watching on TV, we had names there before. And there's a, there's a lot out there. Rick Pitino, I got told by a source late Sunday, Mitch Barnhart would not lean toward hiring Rick Pitino. But there will be people with loud voices, big money, undeniable influence around the program, around the state that will push to say, hey, are we sure we don't want to bring him home and close out his career? Are we sure that he's he's good with finishing out at St. John's and not coming back to Big Blue Nation? I don't think it's crazy. It's not crazy. If that I, – I mean, there's a lot going on, GP. We, I, I will, I will entertain that if it actually becomes something on the table. But just know that could be in the in the wind in the air there. We also had, I don't know if Buzz Williams would be a viable candidate there, uh, but his name's been out there. Bruce Pearl is someone who has the makeup to uh, to handle a job like that. Has made a Final Four. There's a lot. Here's the thing about Kentucky, and it, and you'll notice it's been different than when the Ohio State job came open, and when the Louisville job came open, and when the Michigan job came open. When those jobs came open. You didn't have potential candidate lists, target lists that were like this. Kentucky is different. Doesn't mean that it won't get a no from option one, two, three, and four. But I do believe eventually someone's going to be offered a significant contract, somewhere eight to ten million annually, to coach this program, this prestigious program, to follow John Calipari, and they're going to say yes. Doesn't mean they'll succeed. Doesn't mean it's going to be easy. Doesn't mean they're guaranteed to have all of this glory and be as good or nearly as good as John Calipari. But it's a massive opportunity, and you will be welcomed with open arms by a fan base uh, that is ready for it. I would even say like. Mick Cronin, he might be a name with a high buyout that's at least on the list. The list is more than 10, 12 names deep. Uh, I'm told that Mitch Barnhart, as of our tape time here, has not formally reached out to potential targets or representation yet because they're waiting for Calipari to formally inform the school, which, unless it's happened in the past 25, 30 minutes, still has not happened and still has not met with his players. But a blockbuster earthquaking type of news story Sunday into Monday here in College Hoops. Again, the reporting is that John Calipari is going to meet with his players at his home this afternoon, and then all indications are that he will be introduced as Arkansas's next head coach at some point later this week. Let's move on to the national title Let's game. Go. Can we talk hoops, baby? Purdue Come on. and UConn tonight. It's the two best teams in the country. Can't wait for it. We'll jump into it next on the Ion College Basketball Podcast. We're here on CBS Sports Network.
Welcome back to the CBS Sports Eye on College Basketball Podcast. We're here on CBS Sports Network. I'm Gary Parrish. Matt Norlander is with me. And later on tonight, specifically at 9.20 p.m. Eastern on TBS, we get our national title game. And it's a great one. UConn against Purdue, the two best teams in the country. Combined record, 70-7. and seven. Simple question, how great is this? It's great. And here's why it's great. I wrote a column uh, that you can read right now on CBSSports.com or on your CBS Sports app that basically sets I would tell up, people to keep watching the television show You right can now. watch and read at the same time. I it's can. amazing. You can do it, I promise. Or you know what? Read it once we're done on the show here. It is the stakes here I think are amazing because I think we are guaranteed an epic finale. I don't know if the game will be close, but guess what? Even if the game isn't close, you know what that means? Mm. We get a UConn team that is the best, not just the best UConn team ever, and there's a case for that already without a title. You get one of the best teams, I think, of the past three, four, maybe five decades when you see what they've done. If they beat Purdue by double digits, that will lock up 12 straight NCAA tournament victories for UConn by double digits. They've beaten everyone by 13 or more points. That's if we get the blowout. We get an all-time score. We get a mini dynasty here. UConn in this era. Will we ever see it again? If we do, maybe it'll be UConn and Dan Hurley next year. But other than that, think about the portal, where we are with NIL, how difficult it is to go back-to-back. We've had to wait a measly, what, 17 years to see this. But might we have to wait another 30, 40 after this? That's what's on the table to me if they win big. If they win close... Please give it to me. I want a close game. Yes. Can we see UConn actually get – now, Bama was a contested game tied with a little more than 10 minutes to go, GP, but it wasn't close at the end, a 14-point margin. Can we see UConn locked in a two-possession, a one-possession game with three and change to go here tonight? I'd love it, and it would be a game that in that instance really lived up to the hype of the, of the immensity of this matchup here. We wait and see. On the other side, if it were Purdue that was to win, well, in that case – You've got a national player of the year winning it all, beating. To me, it's the unstoppable team versus the immovable object. And Purdue getting one of the larger upsets in terms of point spread. Not, not the biggest, but one of the largest we'd ever see. And Matt Painter and Purdue winning a first national championship, doing it in epic fashion by beating this UConn team, which has been unbeatable in the tournament. Those are the stakes to me. It's why, in my opinion, this is as tempting and tasty of a title game matchup as we've had in a long time because no matter how it ends it's going to be an amazing story and an epic finale what are your thoughts UConn is a sizable favorite I will say most of the computers and the predictive metrics had this game closer than the betting markets have it so I'm hoping for a classic on paper it should be two number one seeds two teams that have been at the tip top of the sport from November through this day. I don't want to say this is always where we were headed because Houston was a part of this conversation up until the second yes. Jamal Shedd was injured in the NCAA tournament. But once Jamal Shedd was injured in this tournament, it did feel like we were always headed this direction, and now we get it. And it's not just the two best teams in the country. It is arguably the two most important bigs in the country. On one side at Purdue, Zach Eady, now two-time, CBS Sports National Player of the Year. On the other side at UConn, Donovan Klingen, who is now considered among the possibilities to be the number one overall pick in the 2024 NBA draft. And what I love about this matchup, beyond the obvious, is that they're so different. They're similarly built in terms of, you know, they're both tall and they're both heavy. But all Zach Eady's great stuff is mostly on the offensive end, and all Donovan Klingon's great stuff is mostly on the defensive end. They're not one-dimensional players, but Eady's strength is on offense. Yeah. Klingon's strength is on defense. I can't wait to watch these guys get up and down the court for however long they're able to do it. You see the, the st stats there on the screen. Uh, Eady combining for about 44.5 points and rebounds per game in this tournament. Uh, we talked about it on a recent pod, but let's tee it up again. Over, under, 44-and-a-half combined points and rebounds for Edie against Klingon tonight, who they're obviously going to try and induce into some foul issues. That's an early plot line to watch, but I, I figure you're going under because it's a gaudy number, but again, that's what he's averaging, although he's never faced a big like Klingon. That's what I would say. If that's what he's averaging against non-Donovan Klingons, for lack of a better phrase, yeah. then how is he going to get that against Donovan Klingon? To be clear... I won't be surprised if he does, but, like, if I had to put a mortgage payment on it, I would take the under on that. In terms of big men matchups, it's arguably the biggest we've had, and we've had a lot of big ones over the years, but the one that stands out in my memory 
is the Roy Hibbert Greg Oden mm. big man matchup. Our colleague Our at CBS, CBS Sports, yes. Roy Hibbert, and uh, big so, Eagle, big Eagles fan by the way. I hear you know, Roy Hibbert is the best. In, Loves him some Eagles. Uh, he's the best in the business. And just so we're clear, not Philadelphia Eagles. No, like Don Henley. Take it to the limit. One more time. There we go. So um, you you get this situation where it's a massive matchup between bigs, perhaps the biggest since Greg Oden and Roy Hibbert met in the Final Four, obviously Ohio State and Georgetown. Greg Oden goes on to be the number one pick in the draft. Roy Hibbert goes on to be an NBA All-Star. What I remember about that game, sitting courtside, is that the whistles were rough early. Uh, Roy Hibbert was in foul trouble quickly. Greg Oden was in foul trouble quickly. Neither one of them played the final, I believe, 648 of the first half. Minutes were both down for for both of them. I'm not sitting here saying don't call any fouls because if there are fouls, the whistle should blow. I just hope we don't get a situation where at some point in the first half tonight we're looking up and Donovan Klingon is in foul trouble. Zach Eady as well. I agree, and we've got more to, to hit on this game, so I know we're going to get out of here real tight. But I – but. The thing I love about the bigs is the fact that it is a little bit of a throwback, and it's only it's the first time ever in the history of the tournament there's been two starting centers facing off that were 7-2 or taller, and it's only the second time, period, that a Final Four title game matchup had two starting seven-footers face off. The other one is two of the all-time greats, Akeem Olajuwon and Patrick Ewing in 1984. Ewing was viewed as the better player in that game. They were both tremendous, but obviously Ewing was a better college player. Georgetown won that won that head to head. Edie is obviously the better player here. We'll see if that uh, if that sticks. But it is a rare instance. We do not get this often. There's so many there's so many things about this matchup that we just don't get often. And, and one of them is a reigning national champion playing against the national player of the year. We almost never see that. A reigning national champion involved in a one versus one. The only time that's ever happened before was Florida 07, reigning champ one seed, playing Ohio State one seed. And the fact that we have two seven-footers playing each other and uh, a national player year going for a title, it's really awesome. So a lot of the attention early in the game is obviously going to be on Zach Eady and Donovan Klingon. The actual game should be decided or could be decided in the backcourt. Let's focus on the perimeter players next. We'll do that on the Island College Basketball Podcast. We're on CBS Sports Network. Welcome back to the CBS Sports Ion College Basketball Podcast. We are live in Arizona in advance of tonight's national title game between UConn and Purdue. We have discussed the big matchup. That's Zach Eady against Donovan Klingon. But Norlander, I really do think that this game might be decided not by the bigs, but by the players on the perimeter. And there are vast differences between the perimeter-oriented players in these two programs. I'll keep it simple. Purdue has great college guards, but that's what they are. They're great college guards, and they're small. UConn has at least two future NBA guards, and they're bigger and more athletic. Simply put, Purdue is smaller and less athletic at all three guard spots. Do you think that's going to be an issue for the Bullamakers? I think it can. I asked UConn players what if you took Edie off the scouting report, he's item one, two, three, four, and five. Okay, but let's take him out. Then what are you most concerned about? And Tristan, Tristan Newton, Alex Caravan, uh, Cam Spencer, all of them said – Three-point shooting, three-point shooting, three-point shooting. So the physicality of, of Connecticut on, on the perimeter, Stephon Castle, how he is deployed. Because Castle is a, is a dynamite defender, and he can be assigned to different players. How, how he is lined up. In fact, real quick on the perimeter stuff in general, watch for Lance Jones of Purdue because he can be a bogey on different guys tonight. And then watch Castle, who can guard different guys. The, the matchup battle there, how they switch, how Purdue gets success or doesn't is going to be key because Purdue is an elite top three shoot, three point shooting team in the country. UConn's the number one overall offense, but it's not that it's not a it's not a high level three point shooting team. You see what if you watch on the screen there, you can see that they get five starters and double figures, and that's obviously major. But whereas Purdue is hitting three pointers at an outstanding clip right now, heading into this game, 40.6%, that's number two in the country. UConn's not the same. UConn's three point shooting sits at 36%, 61 overall. They get it done with efficiency while taking the right shot. Purdue has to, has to shoot well from three point range tonight. It can't get overwhelmed by UConn's physicality on the wing. And I think the play of, a, of on defense of Castle and then the reliability of Tristan Newton running the offense, GP, I think that's key. Fletcher Lawyer. 
He, he's like Cam Spencer. In fact, I hope we get. I know you're rooting for this too. Mm-hmm. Want a little trash talk, a little back and forth, because they really they're not afraid to, uh, right. to talk it out there. I'd love to see that. But Fletcher Lawyer, Braden Smith, they have to probably combine. Even if Edie goes for 30 plus GP, I think Fletcher Lawyer and Braden Smith probably need to combine for at least. 25 points in this game and shoot better than 35% from three-point range. It's a major, major story to watch and not uh, within the first few possessions. Yes, Edie, it'll start with Edie, but what they can do with their guard play is going to be huge. I do think Purdue needs to shoot well from three to win the game, and that obviously is connected to the perimeter-oriented players we're discussing. I don't think it's as necessary for UConn, but it is worth pointing out that UConn did lose three games this season. I, I know they get called unbeatable yeah. all the time, and, buddy, they look like it In the often. tournament they are. They look like it often, but they have been beaten. Uh, three losses, all three on the road, so they never lost on a neutral, never lost at home. One of the losses was at Kansas inside Allen Fieldhouse. That's almost a scheduled loss. I don't even want to discuss that one. Let's look at the other two. At Creighton, at Seton Hall, in both games, Connecticut shot below 20% from three. That is the type of thing that might need to happen for Purdue to actually upset the Huskies tonight. And one last thing on Purdue's guards, it's not just that um, on the defensive end, UConn's size on the perimeter could cause issues. It's also just simple stuff like getting the ball to Zach Eady. It's harder to do as a smaller guard against bigger guards. That'll be something to watch in the early minutes of this game tonight. When we come back, we'll turn our attention to the coaches. Dan Hurley, Matt Painter, both of them awesome at their jobs. Both of them likely future Naismith Memorial Hall of Famers, but very different in the way they operate. We'll discuss those guys next on the Ion College Basketball Podcast. We're on CBS Sports Network. Welcome back to the CBS Sports Eye on College Basketball Podcast. We're here on CBS Sports Network, and tonight we get it, UConn, Purdue. We've talked about the front court. We've talked about the back court. The men on the sidelines are as responsible for this matchup as anybody else. Dan Hurley at UConn, Matt Painter at Purdue. Norlander, you and I both have known these guys for quite a while now. I think we both like them a lot. Obviously, they're both excellent at their jobs. They are very different personalities and we'll touch on that in a second but coming into the last break I sort of teased it by saying these are two future Naismith Memorial Hall of Fame coaches obviously if Dan gets a second national championship tonight that that almost history says that does it that clinches it I mean they should put him him in tomorrow but there are rules against it but yes unfortunately there's (laughs) rules against this with Matt I think a, a little more up in the air Uh, given that he's just in his first Final Four and doesn't yet have a national championship. But I believe it to be true. I think Matt Painter and Dan Hurley are both in the Hall of Fame someday. Do you agree with me? Uh, yes, uh, Painter is the best coach in Purdue history. Gene Cady, uh, you know, is a, is a Hall of Fame inductee. So, yes, I think he's got a real case there. And they're, they're just absolutely outstanding. And I'm continually fascinated by how different you can, you can win in a variety of different coaching styles in the sport still. Um, and the way that Hurley goes about doing it and the way that Painter goes about doing it are different. But I want to be clear about this with Hurley specifically. He is very analytically minded, very grounded in his approach. He was humble enough, you know, a couple years ago, quick aside, I had two assistants at two different points this season, early in the season. One was in November and then one was in December, reach out to me and say, hey, what's the story with with UConn and its offense? Like, you go back two years ago, three years ago, and they weren't running anything like this. Like, it was extremely rudimentary. They were defensive-based. They were winning on toughness. Well, a lot of that is... Hurley's ability to adapt. I'm going to shout out Luke Murray as well because he is the offensive coordinator and he has put in a ton of time and he's very responsible for for that identity flipping. So Hurley, comfortable in change, wanting to change, not having a huge ego to say it's got to be me. He consistently and deservedly so gives credit to Murray. Kamani Young, who runs the defense, has been amazing. And it's easy to look at Hurley and kind of paint him as a character caricature because let's face it he's hilarious to watch coach and he's got all these kind of different expressions but he has a lot of the stuff that max makes matt painter great and painter is just as easy to talk to as anyone about this stuff he's very very normal i spoke with robbie hummel uh obviously a purdue great just a couple of nights ago about all this and he's like this was this was going to happen but um it just took it took this long for people to realize and see how great painter is and he's just 
he is a he is a normal dude who goes to work, commits to the style that he has, and is beloved by everyone. I'm really happy for both these guys that they get to shine and go head to head on a stage like this tonight. I would say it took till now for you know people walking around this convention center to recognize how great Matt Painter is. I don't think it took this for people in the industry, other coaches, yeah, yeah, yeah. to recognize it. In our Candid Coaches series in the off season, we always ask a series of questions to roughly 100 college basketball coaches. We grant them anonymity in exchange for honesty. And among the questions this off season was, who's the best coach who hasn't yet made a Final Four? And more than half, half of the votes came in for yeah. Matt Painter. Now we'll have to get a new answer this off season because Painter has now made yeah. a Final Four. But it was crystal clear from that candid coaches series that uh, regardless if some you know fans on twitter are getting their jokes off coaches who actually have to prepare for this guy and work against this guy and recruit against this guy and evaluate against this guy they know that he's a special talent and so he didn't need this to prove it but it's nice that he has this to quiet some of the other skeptics, perhaps even in his own fan base when they lose to a school like Fairleigh Dickinson in the round of 64 last year. To Dan Hurley, like the obvious stuff is there. Just go look at the Wikipedia page. I mean, the accomplishments are piling yeah. up. As Dan has said many times, um, they are starting to make history at a program where it is very hard to make history based on all of the history that has already been made. But he is now running not just one of the best, but I think you can reasonably say the best basketball program yeah. in America. And it was hilarious yesterday. I know you saw this. Somebody asked him, um, how have you been able to navigate this transfer portal? You lose three of your top six from last season's team. You're right here again. You just roster built and developed and, and did it in a way that has put you in a position to be a back-to-back -back national champion. What are you doing that other coaches don't understand? And he said, I don't think I should talk about it and yeah. help the people who don't know what they're doing. I know what I'm The implication was we know what we're doing at UConn. We know how to do it, and we're not going to give a cheat sheet to anybody else around the country. Also, just contrasting Matt and Dan, Matt, this earlier last week, said that he had not had a technical foul in 10 years. And as I was sitting on set yesterday with Steve Lapis on CBS Sports Network, he said he was doing a UConn-New Hampshire game earlier this year, and Dan Hurley got a technical <laughs> in that one. So those are the different personalities, but they're both excellent, excellent coaches. They are. And Matt Painter's the guy that'll sit down and have a conversation with you over a beer. It would be a wonderful conversation. Dan Hurley might want to uh, go on a speed walk with you and talk about uh, everything that's affecting his life at once. They are, they are, <laughs> they are different-minded coaches. Uh, Hurley loves his, loves his yoga, loves his meditation, loves his mushroom coffee or tea or whatever. And uh, and Painter, is he's he's such a savvy mind. I, I can't wait to see how these two teams come out tonight. I, I Here's the last thing for me on this. I truly believe, even though the game is so huge, it's a huge stage, I expect, because of the, the leadership of these two head coaches, to have a lot of composure on this court. UConn was there a year ago. Purdue hasn't been there yet. But watching the body language and how it stems from, from Painter, it's really, really impressive. I expect, even at, no matter the result, I really do think it will be a well-played game with players who are not afraid of the big stage. And it'll be an incredible night for one of those men. Either Dan Hurley will go to sleep tonight or more likely very early tomorrow morning as a rare two-time national champion. Or Matt Painter is going to bring Purdue a national championship, which has obviously been a dream for him for a long, long time. When we come back, absolutely, we'll pick the game. UConn-Purdue, it's set for tonight here at State Farm Stadium in Glendale, Arizona. Who's going to win it? We'll give you our best shot next. It's the Ion College Basketball Podcast on hey, that's CBS me. Sports Network with Matt Watch Norlander Hold on. showing off Hold his on. handles. Let's go. Money? Cash? What? Did you make it? Let's go. Okay. How many takes? One. All right. Welcome back to the CBS Sports Eye on College Basketball Podcast. It's the final Monday of the 2023-24 season. We got the final game of the 2024 NCAA tournament. It is set for 9.20 p.m. Eastern tonight. You'll watch it on TBS. It's one seed UConn, one seed Purdue. How do you see this game breaking down? I think we're going to get a competitive game in the first half. I expect Edie to show up and be the national player of the year, GP. I think he's going to have a really good game. I think, I think, 
Klingon's going to avoid foul trouble in the first half, and I hope it's the case. I want, and what everyone wants to see, we want to see the bigs go head to head. Edie has not; he has played some really good big men. He hasn't played someone with the with the verticality, the size of Klingon, and it's it's conceivable that he has some that he has some trouble there. Ultimately, I think once we get into the second half, you're going to see. To me, it's which. Is you kind of going to do this by committee, or are we going to have someone step up and be be the star here? Because right now, through the first you know, the first game of the Final Four, Stephon Castle's probably in the lead for Final Four most, most outstanding player. We got to pick that before we get out of the show too. But I think you'll have either be Cam Spencer going off, Tristan Newton being the lead player there. I think UConn will create separation. I think we will have a game that's like okay, might we have something with you know five six minutes to go, a UConn lead. Ultimately, I think UConn's going to win. Do you want my score now? Give me your score now. I. I have refused to pick against UConn in the tournament, and I have refused to pick a final score that was by single digits. Now, this Purdue team is the second-best team in the country, so I will say it's UConn 80, Purdue 70. I I want a close game. Give me UConn in a close game, but I'm still picking by double digits, the narrowest, narrowest margin possible, GP. 80-70, to 70, Huskies win back-to-back. Put Dan Hurley in the Hall of Fame tomorrow. You mentioned Stefan Castle. He was obviously great in the national semifinals almost by design, and I mean by Alabama's design. Right. Alabama didn't want him to be great, but the reason he was able to pop off is because Alabama chose to guard them in a certain way, and after the game, Dan Hurley, you know, acknowledged that mm-hmm. they, they they sagged off of him, and he's a below-average three-point shooter, an incredible NBA prospect, a possible lottery pick, but a subpar three-point shooter, and I know that he burned them and made them pay. I'm not convinced that's an incorrect strategy. I think Nate Oates had to pick something like you got to pick something because you can't just play them straight up and he picked something it's probably the right thing to pick and then it just didn't go well but i don't think like if purdue decided to play stefan castle similarly tonight i don't think that's a mistake do you think it's a mistake no but i almost wonder if that happens we have a dante divincenzo moment where he was a freshman and you know granted divincenzo's role was even smaller than castles it'll be interesting to see that and to me I'm going to just double back on Castle's defense, which I think will be a major factor on, on, on Purdue's guards. And then Lance Jones, who is the dynamo for Purdue on the defensive end. He needs to. I think he needs to be on Newton. But if, if Cam Spencer gets hot, how he's deployed, because undeniably, like Braden Smith, Fletcher Lawyer, good players, offensive-oriented. They don't have – Trey Kaufman-Wren, who UConn's players told me is, a, is, a, is an underrated player, I agree – they're, they're going to need – they need to play their A game. Purdue needs to play their A game and hope that UConn is no better than a B-plus, maybe a B to have a chance to win. But uh, the defensive assignments from their lead wings, I think, are the things to watch out for. You and I have been talking every week on this podcast multiple times for years. You know how I think. You know what matters to me. You know what doesn't. So you've got UConn. UConn is more efficient offensively, more efficient defensively, ahead of Purdue in the computers. You've got UConn. They've been the better team this season. They've got more future NBA players. They've got size advantage in the backcourt. Huskies! I'm still going with Purdue. Okay. And it's because I've been on the Boilermakers this entire season. I have always believed they were, or at least for a long time believed, they are our next national champion. And I recognize that they would have to pull what would be a sizable upset on this stage, yeah. but if any team is capable of doing it, I do think it is a team coached by Matt Painter and a team led by Zach Eady. I think Purdue wins the game. I'll go 72-70. Zach Eady, most outstanding player of the Final Four. Real quick, just say a name. I'm going to give you Tristan Newton, and reminder, we're going to have a post-game show. I said, just say a name. Okay. Shouts to Devin Downey. Shouts to Chester, South Carolina. <laughs> Terry Teagle, Huck Newton. Larnell. Thanks so much. Enjoy the game tonight. We'll see you back on CBS Sports Network tomorrow.